Warning, spoilers for the entirety of Avatar The Last Airbender and light spoilers for the comics and Korra up ahead. Here's an uncontroversial statement, Avatar is a progressive show. From the very first episode, we're introduced to a world that doesn't shield the viewer from the realities of war, genocide, sexism, and racism. Entire episodes are dedicated to portraying refugees and the poor in a kind light, and it doesn't pull any punches when delivering its message about anti-war and anti-aggression. In fact, the entire final arc of the show is centered around Aang trying to find a peaceful end to the Fire Nation's war of aggression, a war that's a heavily implied metaphor for both the Germans in World War II as well as the United States' wars to spread democracy. We should share this prosperity with the rest of the world. In our hands is the most successful empire in history. It's time we expanded it. You can very much feel that it's a show that was released with the anti-war movement of the early 2000s as its backdrop. But for all of its progressivism, there's one moment I've always found very interesting. After Aang and the gang defeat the big bad and restore peace to the world, we see Zuko's coronation scene. This is the culmination of Zuko's entire character arc, and it's a cheerful and happy moment, but I couldn't help but feel a little bit of whiplash watching the characters cheer at the coronation of a new monarch. You'd think that with the knowledge of all the previous avatars who have spent eons just sitting around in the spirit realm, you'd think that Aang would go, hmm, maybe having kings and queens isn't the way to go? Like, hmm, maybe a system that gives unlimited power to one individual is susceptible to tyrants who want to commit genocide? Just maybe. Now, these kinds of questions about society at large wouldn't start getting asked until The Legend of Korra, years after the original show's run. But in avoiding this issue, in an otherwise politically progressive show, it raises all kinds of questions about the relationship between the political and religious institutions of the world. General Iroh reveals that the four nations exist in a state of balance, and that in pursuing an imperial war, the Fire Nation has thrown the world off balance. While Aang probably has moral and political objections to the war, restoring balance to the world is his religious justification. So when the Phoenix King is defeated, balance is restored upon the coronation of a new king. In essence, Aang's spiritual and religious knowledge reinforces the state so long as good leaders like Zuko are in the position of power, the Avatar won't challenge the powers that be. And this is huge! I know, we're talking about a kids show that takes pretty clear stances on right and wrong, but this oversight opens an entire Pandora's box on religion's political purposes. For example, the Fire Nation is the only nation with an organized clergy, and they're used to build a cult of personality around the Fire Lord and build support for the war. In this case, religion is entirely used as an instrument of the state, something similar to the papacy and the church in medieval times. But seeing Aang of the Air Nation, the element of freedom, cozy up to kings and queens, it's kind of strange. I think we can all agree that life under a monarchy isn't free, so naturally, Aang's freedom-loving personality would place him, at least politically, against the thrones of the various nations. But he's also a religious adherent to non-violence and peace, which is an inherent contradiction within his character. This is what makes his final character arc so intriguing. And while the show dissects Machina Aang out of the moral question, where he didn't have to betray his faith or give up his political cause, since there was a third option that wasn't foreshadowed at all, in real life, sea lion turtles don't exist, so religious institutions have to wrangle with the very real questions posed to them by the world of politics. In East Asia, where the show borrows most of its imagery from, we see this kind of dynamic a whole lot. Air is the element of freedom, and that's what the communist revolutionaries were fighting for in the middle of the 20th century. As the red communist wave spread throughout Eastern Asia, putting aside our own thoughts of what was to come, liberation was at the core of what drove them. It's easy to forget, but the people rose up in a righteous fury against their political leaders. China was a highly unequal society prior to the 1949 revolution, with a tiny minority of landlords and village chiefs controlling the lives of their subjects. The leader of the feudal republic, Chiang Kai-shek, was responsible for the deaths of millions who were slaughtered under his regime. 
Likewise, Vietnam and other southeastern nations experienced brutal colonial rule, not unlike the way the Fire Nation imposed itself upon the other nations. But not everyone was on board with the revolution. In China, after the revolution had been won by the communists, Chairman Mao Zedong launched an attack on an unlikely opponent, Confucian. China was, and still is, a deeply Confucian society, and Mao argued that Confucianism represented everything wrong with China. Back in the old days of feudal China, during the time of serfs and slaves, Mao argued that Confucianism was used as an ideology of bondage, a doctrine that kept people weak, down, and enslaved to their leaders. The love for social peace and social order that Confucian espoused was used as a cudgel for domination. In short, just like the Avatar's spiritualism upheld the monarchy, so did Confucius support the destructive existing social order. China had to shed the old ways of thinking, and so Mao launched the Cultural Revolution in an attempt to create the new communist man. In other places in Southeast Asia, Buddhism also found itself pitted against the newly empowered communists, and this time with an unlikely ally, the CIA. In Thai, the government officials were instructed to teach respect for father, mother, king, and state, and to make clear the distinction between communism and Buddhism. In Burma, the prime minister took direct shots at Karl Marx, saying his ideas were less than one-tenth of a particle of dust that lies at the feet of our great Lord Buddha. The CIA jumped at the opportunity to drive a wedge further between Buddhist and communist groups, giving away tons of cash to nonprofits, foundations, and Buddhist educational and development groups that would distribute fierce anti-communist propaganda. The operation got so big that by 1956, the State Department had established a Buddhist committee to help with the propaganda effort. Their efforts were ultimately unsuccessful, but again, they show how spirituality can be used as a way to protect the status quo. But still, we have to remember that real life isn't just a storybook like Avatar. The revolutionary communists didn't exactly uphold the principles of liberation once in power. There were many, many excesses that would have put the world out of balance. The Cultural Revolution was as much a political revolution as it was an ideological one. As Mao channeled the antagonism against Confucius towards his very real political enemies. And Buddhism is an incredibly varied tradition. Some are peaceful and apolitical, while others can promote violent aggression. The show itself shows how very different religious sects can be when Aang speaks with the previous avatars and they all disagree with him on how to handle the Fire Lord. As much as it's a fun thought exercise to graft the world of Avatar onto the real world, our politics are just way too messy to make a coherent comparison. But this thought experiment does reveal how our spiritual traditions can be used as a way to both keep us in bondage and as a way to fight for liberation. The Jet Ang rivalry in Season 1 has a whole lot of religious subtext that most people miss out on. Both Jet and Aang are freedom-loving revolutionaries, but they go about it in completely different ways. Jet isn't spiritual, so he doesn't care about any of Aang's principles of non-aggression. If hurting an old man will help him in the war effort, he'll do it. So when he meets the gang, he latches on to Sokka as a potential ally to his revolution, a character who throughout the show reveals his skepticism of everything mystical and spiritual. I don't think that's a coincidence either. Spirituality is constantly shown as the natural enemy to political violence in the show. And again, it's a story that resembles real life, as the communist revolutions of East Asia were largely atheistic. What did the communists think about political violence? Well, I'll let Karl Marx handle this one. We have no compassion, and we ask no compassion from you. When our turn comes, we shall not make excuses for the terror. This conflicts clearly with Aang's spiritualism, and so Jet had to be stopped. With all this in mind, this makes the politics of Avatar The Last Airbender incredibly idealist. We can all agree that violence is bad and inner peace is good, but the show flattens the incredible intricacies of revolutionary politics and revolutionary violence. Take Hama from the Puppet Master episode. 
Here we see a waterbender who was captured by the firebenders in their imperial war and tortured for years. She escapes by learning the unknown art of bloodbending and spends her life enacting her revenge on the Fire Nation. Like in Jet's episode, the moral of the story is to not let yourself be consumed by this revolutionary rage. The episode ends with Hama being sent to a Fire Nation prison once more, and like the Zuko coronation scene, I felt major whiplash watching this. Here you had a revolutionary waterbender being handed off to the Fire Nation, a nation known to torture, and it's painted as a satisfying conclusion because hurting innocent citizens is bad. And well, yeah, I'm sure we can all agree with that. But the show's idealism leaves it unwilling and unable to seriously tackle these questions. The Fire Nation is in a state of total war, where the entire nation is built upon providing support for their expansionary imperialist war. Are their citizens not at the minimum complicit in this? What about when Fire Nation citizens occupy the lands of another people? Is their mere presence not an act of aggression deserving of retaliation? Is violence against an occupying force bad? I don't have all the answers, but I sure as hell know that Avatar's cheerful and conciliatory attitudes towards these very, very serious issues doesn't have them either. I would have liked to see the team try to convince Hama that, that she's lost her way and have her join them in their fight, but the show doesn't offer much in the way of redemption for its more revolutionary characters. Jet's arc, for example, is abandoning the revolution entirely and becoming a peaceful refugee instead, which the show portrays as a good thing since it aligns with Aang's spiritual principles. We don't see him continuing the fight, but being more disciplined with his strategy. Nope, no, it's just abandoning it altogether, which is a really strange message to send. I love The Last Airbender, but it's an incredibly idealist show, and that idealism makes me disagree with it on a lot of its messaging. But what do you think? I haven't seen The Legend of Korra yet, and I'm excited to see how it tackles some of the questions I had while watching the original. Let's talk about it in the comments, but no spoilers, because I want to watch it, and I might make a part 2.